a short introduction to Teresa, our speaker. Teresa, we got to know each other through Syncletica, an exciting study program, which is initiated by her at her monastery in Barcelona, where we combine themes from the perspective of theology, fine arts, music, and the Bible. Teresa, with her rich knowledge and experience in public health, politics, and theology, among others, is one of the most outspoken and courageous faces of the church, someone I personally look up to and admire. Um, and responding to her talk, we have Jakob Freumann, who's based in Austria, but just returned from Sea-Watch, a rescue ship in the Mediterranean Sea, where he's actively engaged in rescuing people who are fleeing from their home countries and welcoming them as guests on board to begin a new life. A theologian, teacher, and social activist. Welcome, Jakob, and over to you, Teresa. <clears throat> All right, so thank you, Anson, for your presentation and welcome all of you who are here today. I know now I'm supposed to speak for 15 minutes, so I'll go right away into the topic that I would like to introduce and which is only one of many challenges that the church and the faith faces today because of the way our society has changed what the new topics or what has emerged in this society as challenges for the church. I said there are many, some are new. The one I will be talking about, it's new in its political way of being presented, not new in itself because it is sexual diversity and sexual diversity is not new. It's not that nowadays there is sexual diversity and before there was none. It's always been there, but certainly it is different. The presence of that diversity in the society. And it is a challenge for the church because of that. But before I, I go into the topic, I would like to mention that this is not, of course, the only challenge, and it might also not to be the most pressing one. When I hear that Jacob is coming back from being uh, in a ship, like uh, rescuing people from the sea, well, it certainly has an urgency that our topic has for some people too, because there is violence also involved, direct physical violence in this sexual discrimination, but. Uh, for me, the topic of poverty remains the strongest and the most white and sometimes the most un unacknowledged challenge that we all as human beings have. The fact that we have a society with 1,000 uh, million people uh, dying from hunger, and this is uh, such an inequality that uh, it's a fundamental issue to address, and the fundamental issues that the Bible talks about when it challenges us to be inclusive or to be welcoming and embracing in the language of the Old Testament or for uh, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, the First Testament, we know the, the way we name it. It depends on our religious context, but we are speaking of texts that have a treasure in it. And it is when they speak about the widow, the orphan, the immigrant. Don't mistreat the widow, the orphan, the immigrant. These are a figure that today continues to be a challenge, not for faith only, not for churches, not for the Catholic church only, it is a human challenge. The widow is a woman and the widow is a woman without the man next to it. Of course, we have feminism and nowadays we don't want to think of women as needing a man by her side to be uh, independent and autonomous in the society, but it is true that the majority of po poverty, the majority of poor people in the world, it's the fe fem feminization of poverty. And this is a reality. So it is the figure of the vi widow. You can imagine it as a, a woman with few children. And this is in divorce, divorce, when we have divorce, the women also, as a general rule, of course, there are many exceptions, but um, stay with the children and, and become poorer. And that would be a huge topic, one in which I have also worked and I'm interested not the widow in itself, but the, the role of women in society and in the church. And I said also the orphan, right? The orphan is this status of children. Maybe nowadays in the society, it seems to be central and not uh, secondary. And we could discuss about it. But as you know, there are many laboring children and even soldier children in the world. And that is very uh, also key topic and of course the immigrant that is huge topic 
nowadays, and it's a huge topic for Europe, and it's a huge topic to confront the churches. Pope Francis has spoken a lot about it, but that would be another one. And in Austria, I know there is, like in many other countries in Europe, but maybe in Austria especially, a, a public confrontation about it or in a strong way. So all this is an introduction and I might have already gone over my time for the whole thing. So let me go directly to one table that I would like to share with you and that will should help me to introduce the topic of the sexual diversity. Overview of sexual human sexual diversity. This first part will be almost um, all factual or but it's important for our discussion afterwards because I feel otherwise some of the terms and some of some of the realities around sexual diversity are a bit might be a bit confused so let me go over this in this first segment but my question the leading question is not only overview of human sexuality but do we want to have a theological anthropology for a majority because in my over, over overview i will clearly show you that there is a majority that fall into what we call binary categories. Binary categories exist and they uh, correspond to how the majority of humanity seems to be living his, her, its, their own sexuality. Indeed, it exists. But here's my question. Do we want to have a theological anthropology for a majority or for all? Because if we want to have it for all, then we'll have to engage a complexity that I'll try to show you in this overview on this table. Sex, we speak about sexual diversity, so of course we are going to speak about sex, but not only sex, we need to speak about something called gender also, and not only that, we need to speak about something called desire. Sex, gender, and desire are the three categories uh, that I need to make an overview of human sexual diversity. How do I define them? I defined it, this is not an absolute definition that other people might want to do it differently, but for clarification, and I propose to you for our discussion, there is something that's an objective biological fact. And I'll be explaining or, or showing or sharing with you what I mean by that. But I think it's important to distinguish objective biological fact from subjective experience of one's own sex. And the fact that objective facts exist and subjective experiences exist do not mean that we can separate them or um, break them apart, but they exist and are to be understood also for what they are. So we have sex as objective biological fact. We have gender as subjective experience of one's own sex. Gender can also be not only the subjective experience, but the social uh, valuing of the objective biological facts, how you link those facts, what we call sex, to a certain role in society. There is a subjective aspect and a social aspect, how others view you because of that. But I'm here concentrating in the subjectivity. And then we have desire, which would be akin to sexual orientation. Let's go with the objective biological fact. There is something called chromosomical sex. I think you all know there is this XX on XY, and that is associated to XX would be female, XY male. Okay, but also, here's how my, my tabella, my, my thing will work. It's something for the majority, truly so, but that's not all the story. There is not only at higher levels, but also at the chromosomical level, our chromosomes, our genes, what we have inside each of our cells. It is a pair called the sexual chromosomes that for the majority, either XX or XY, yes, but also. We have something called, well, the name, it doesn't matter, Klinefelter, but what's important is that you look at these letters, right? Klinefelter has XXY. If XX is woman, male, female, and XY is male, what is XXY at the chromosomical level? We have also X zero, only an X. If XX is female and XY is male, what is X? Nothing else. Not possible to understand dichotomically. And this, we have Klinefelter, one in every 1,000 newborns, and Turner, one in every 5,000. As I said, the majority don't have it, but 
that's a lot of people. My whole point in this first part is even if only one person, even if only one person in the whole world would not fit into the binary scheme, that's enough for me. Enough for me to adapt to the person, not to have the person adapting to the theoretical framework of binarism. But it's not only one person, it's many millions. But that's also not everything. We have XXXY, we have XYY. By the way, XYY, when I studied medicine, I finished my medical school in 1990 in Barcelona. And this XYY, you see that it has two of the letters that signify the male. They were called the super male and they were associated to criminality and, and that was supposed to be more prevalent in prisons. That's how I was taught in the medical school. So you see how the stereotypes go to what length. And this is the most important part of my presentation, the three dots and the word others. All that I will be presenting will be certain complexity or overview, but there is more, others. We don't know everything and we should be able to what, dissect and, and do an autopsy or a vivisection of every human being to know all the details of all the aspect only at the objective fact. Move on, we move on, gonadal. Gonadal means ovaries and testicles. Yes, majority has either ovaries or testicles, but also. But also, can you have an ovary and a testicle? Is that possible in a human being? Well, of course it's possible. There are people with one ovary in one side and one testicle in the other side. But there are people with one ovary and an ovotestis. What is an ovotestis? This is uh, in human beings and also in mammals in general. An ovotestis is a gonad, gonad, this name. So a gland that produces gam gamet, and this is the, the sexual, um, um, the capacity for the, for the befruchtung, the fecundation. So these cells that will be able to, to be um, engendering the new cell and the new life, you can have half of your gonad, half of your uh, gland with ovary tissue and half with testicular tissue. And it's also possible to have two ovotestes, so one of those in each side. That is what in medicine and in society has been known forever as hermaphroditism. And that would be the classical term. Nowadays, we have even worse terms for that or um, negative. I understand that negative labels, medical labels that I think none of us would like to, to be given those labels. For example, also known as OTDSD, ovotesticular disorder of sex development. So can you imagine a teenager going into the clinic and then coming back as, okay, I have an OTDSD, an ovotesticular disorder of sex development. That's horrible. It sounds horrible. So that's important how we label all these. And this, the numbers are the latest actualization. I did that in 2018, but it has not changed much. One maybe in every 45,000. So that's a big difference. So if you compare with Klinefelter or with Turner, right? Klinefelter, one in every 1,000. Um, hermaphroditism in every 45,000. We don't know the numbers as completely set, but so you have an idea. But this is not all. And remember, we are only in the sex. So we move to genital. And you all know vagina or penis, male and female. But also, also here, of course, we have variants, variations, something called congenital adrenal hyperplasia. One in every 13,000. What does that is, is basically an masculine, so-called masculine hormone, but it's also feminine because the suprarenal, the gland that's above the kidney produces it. And when it produces it with um, excess, then you have somebody with XX, as I indicated here. So it should be a female, but it has completely the external appearance of a male because it has had this effect of the hormone. And you can have also androgen insensitivity syndrome, and that's the other extreme, right? You have somebody with XY, as it, it is indicated, but it has the cells do not receive the androgen, the masculine hormone. And then you have a feminine, feminized body with an XY and many others. And this is known nowadays as intersex, but also has a medical name, disorder of sex development. All this is about sex. So we can say as a, as a big number that at least 0.5% of people are not standard male or female. I'm, I'm only speaking of the objective biological fact. 
The most recent survey on the topic from uh, the UK, they speak about 1%. But OK, I want to be on the safe side so that these numbers you can present to any person, also people who are against this uh, sexual diversity being emphasized. And you can be sure that the numbers um, cannot be challenged uh, on factual ground. So let's say at least, because it's more than enough, at least 0.5, but probably more but at least 0.5 of people. So one in every 200, one in every 200 uh, are not standard male or female. But as I said, that's not all. We have gender subjective experience. You can be feminine or masculine. That's dichotomy, but as you all know, also. Also transgender, transsexual, so that you might have this XX ovary vagina, so all perfect in the binary sense for the sex, and yet you might feel masculine, or you might have all perfect in binary understanding, XY testicle penis and feel feminine. And this is known as transsexuality or transgender is a more umbrella term because for example, transvestite that uh, desires and likes and practices this dressing with women's clothes uh, or the other way around, that's under the umbrella of transgender, normally not under the umbrella of transsexual, but I don't want to discuss terms. And of course, it has a medical name uh, known as gender dysphoria or gender identity disorder. I said at least one in every 30,000, but it might be, according to last surveys, one in every 3,000. We won't discuss because of numbers, but it's important to know. And of course, other names, gender queer, non-binary, bigender, agender, others. And finally, sexual orientation, heterosexual would be the corresponding to the binary, but also, and this is well known by all of you, homosexual, bisexual, asexual, that also people define themselves as not interested in sex, as to desire. Of course, they have a sex, an objective biological fact. They might have a gender, a clear subjective understanding, but no desire. And pansexual, it's not written, but it's also possible, at least those numbers are also one in every 100 males, one in every uh, females, and one in every 50 males. So up to here, my presentation of the diversity, and then um, I, I can stop with that question, right? That this is a presentation that's a challenge in itself, and do we want to have a theological anthropology? What does the church have to do and the anthropology that comes from our uh, gospel and biblical understanding. That will be our next uh, topic, our next one. Let's continue from where we broke off. Uh, may I invite the groups to uh, share a few thoughts one by one quickly? So it was, I think for all of us, a lot of new facts. Like we didn't know about, about um, the, st the stats on it, <laughs> on, on sexual diversity. And we also had different views if, of what is important. If it's more important what you feel and, and what you desire, for instance, or, or what your actual um, chromosomical difference is. And yeah, I think we didn't get much further. Thank you, Xalpa. Um, room two? Um, I think we are room two. Uh, we didn't speak about who does the presentation. So <laughs> we uh, first uh, talked a bit about the titles, about this uh, theological anthropo um, anthropology. And uh, we are not really sure what uh, you mean about this. So maybe you could explain also this title. We tried to uh, find a a solution or an answer, but maybe you can do it. And then we talked also about this um, table and that um, it's very important also to see that there are so many different types and that nothing is just binary and you can, yeah. Okay, yeah, that was my room. <laughs> okay, I can share something. Um, yeah, we talked about um, that sometimes, like, that it all starts with um, raising the awareness because sometimes we don't even know what we don't know. 
So like hearing this and like having these facts, we realized, hey, I didn't, I didn't even know I didn't know it. So yeah. And then we talked about that, yeah, like sometimes maybe not um, informing yourself or educating yourself come, comes out of a place of fear of complexity because it's a, like, it seems complex and it feels complex. And yeah, well, sometimes we're afraid of that. And yeah, we, we said that we fight that, but like more embrace it. First of all, we were surprised how many people don't fit into the conventional categories of sex or gender or um, yeah, sexual desire. Um, what we, what what some of us can see can say from personal experience is that younger people nowadays are able to express their identity more freely compared to say 40 years ago. And we feel the church will leave many people behind if they don't allow that freedom of expression. What sticks out is that well, yeah, when it comes down to it, the church only allows a sexual life if you're heterosexual and want to have children. And if they don't allow the same experience for everyone, we feel that's a problem. And yeah, what became clear is that it's difficult sometimes to bring together what the church teaches, what we experience personally and how we want to treat people who don't fit into those conventional categories. Yeah, um, we also discussed a bit uh, the term of uh, theological anthropology. There were some uncertainties about it and we tried to answer them, but maybe Teresa, you can give again a definition from your side regarding this uh, question. And then um, Susan um, shared a bit of her experiences with um, friends she has. And just to sum it up, all those experiences showed more or less in a very simple way that there are uh, many identities out there that don't fit in the established dichotomy, dichotomy of, uh, of the church. So it's not only about statistics that Teresa um, has shown. I think they're all very valid and important to see. But it's also concrete people and experiences, I guess, all of us have. So this is nothing abstract or something just numerical. It's uh, really daily life, uh, which should be uh, acknowledged. Thank you, Jakob. Uh, Teresa, may I request you to continue uh, your talk? Yes. And uh, I don't know whether I, um, I answered though, uh, some of these questions right away or tried to. And one would be um, this term of theological anthropology, how I understand, but before I do that, because usually uh, this having 15 minutes is not my usual way to go about. So what I showed are the numbers, but I skipped the two testimonies that I usually add to the numbers, but I would like to do it now because I think this last comment from Jacob, it's very important that we flesh out a little bit what I have expressed. So let me read from a book that I uh, recommend to all of you. The book has the title, This is My Body. And this is, of course, the words of Jesus and the Last Supper that serve as the institution of the Eucharist. This is my body. But it's the uh, hearing the theology of transgender Christians. And it was published in 2016 in the UK. And I can give you the reference uh, or later. But let me read from that book one testimony. It says so. At the time of the foundation of the civils, I was in my 50s. And I was a senior finance executive with a multinational. My wife had died of a heart condition a few years before. My elder daughter had flown the nest, but my younger daughter was still at the school and needed my attention. The times were not propitious for transgender people. Society has said, society did not understand church people were mostly hostile. Uh, who is speaking here is a person that uh, is from the Anglican church. Church people were mostly hostile and had it been known to my employers, I would certainly have been dismissed 
were speaking only of 20 years ago. I would have been dismissed. Consequently, I lived at home as female, at work as male. Full transition only became possible when I took early retirement. However, in my search for myself, I had found God and come to the church. This would be a clear case of somebody that suffered because of this uh, mis or false assignment of gender, could not show because of this discrepancy between what the objective facts were and the subjective experience of her own sexual identity. Because of that, suffered and was only relieved when it could match the two. That's what we can understand as transsexual experience um, that does not challenge in a absolute way the dichotomy. It seems to even reinforce it because it says, okay, I am in the wrong body. Some people express it like this. What I need is to transform that body, to intervene in the body so that it matches my feeling. But of course, this is, as uh, Judith was also saying, with the complexity that's not the whole picture that exists and we should not forget. So that when we say uh, we go beyond the binary, it's not exactly beyond, it's a complexity that has to include the experience of the binary for also transsexual people as something very strong for some of them. And at the same time, something that I'm going to read now, which is our next testimony. One second. The process, this is Michelle, and it's also from the same book that I mentioned to you. The process of changing my gender took place over more than a decade, starting in my 30s. Through snippets of information, and see, she says changing my gender, so changing how she perceived her own sexual identity, that's what she's talking about. Through snippets of information from doctors, supplemented with my own research, I began to unravel things about my childhood that turned my world upside, upside down. I realized that I was not the person I had always thought I was. The more I learned, the more I felt torn in two. I am not sure how I survived that time. What I came to understand was that I was born with intersex characteristics and had at least two gender reinforcement surgeries to make me appear more masculine, as well as psychosocial gender reinforcement. This I just make a note that uh, when I was at the medical school, uh, that was what was thought the best medical practice, which is you have a baby that's born with a genital organ that has more than two centimeters, you call that a penis, regardless of whether XX chromosomes are present. If it is less than one centimeter, you call that a clitoris, regardless of the chromosomic information. But if it is between one and two, what do you do then? You cut it. That's what it was taught in medical school and still is in some, although the intersex community are challenging these medical practices. You amputate the most sensitive part of this organ that receives the pleasure, and you do that for the sake of fitting the mental or the social scheme. So you cut, and you then make it a clitoris because supposedly to have a penis that starts with less than two centimeters, it's too much of a, an impossibility for a fulfilled life, which I'm saying with irony, but at the same time, because of the stereotyping and the discrimination, that is not without basis to think that a child will suffer if it cannot show a genital that looks normal or almost normal. So this was the medical practice. So when she speaks about gender reinforcement surgeries, it means it speaks about amputation to have her fit uh, uh, this, in her case, this female, sorry, the male. So it was on the contrary that she had then interventions on her secondary characteristics that were female. For example, she can have you might have a clitoris that's big enough or an organ that's big enough to be called a penis, but you might have a cleft between the genitals that look like an open labia, but then you have a gender reinforcement surgery which sews that together so that you don't have an opening under your penis because that would be deemed to be uh, impossible to be compatible 
fulfilled, fulfilled psychological and social life. So she speaks like that, mm, to, mm, at least two reinforcement surgeries to make me appear more masculine, as well as psychosocial gender reinforcement. When I changed my life by living as a woman rather than as a man, as she had done since childhood, when I changed, not much about me was different, although the way I was treated certainly was. I was the same person I had always been, and it was not that difficult a change to make. I'm not sure how anybody could have related to me as a man. As I began to see men through a different lens, I realized I was never quite like them. In hindsight, I can see that there are many differences, but these are external, social, and to do with people's perceptions. I am treated very differently when seen as a woman compared to when seen as a man. I soon realized though, that just as I had not been a man, I was not a woman either, nor could I ever be. I could live and perform as a woman in a similar way to how I had lived and performed as a man. I found myself living as a woman, accepted that way, more comfortable that way, and decided to stay like that. I did not know then that I could be anything else. The determinism of the meta-narrative of women trapped in men's bodies, of a social female gender being hardwired into the brain of somebody with a male body or vice versa, was meaningless to me. I would have preferred not to have a gender, but I lived in a society where binary gender is compulsory. So choose that which was not chosen for me. Eventually, I found the two models of gender difficult to understand because people are not always as clear cut. I found it increasingly difficult to make the effort to give out the signals that denote female rather than male. These days, I can be referred to as male by one person and female by the next. I do not correct people because they are not wrong. This Two testimonies that uh, we might um, talk further about, but now the term theological anthropology. This is actually a term that classically it's being used in the theology schools to talk about uh, a way to approach the, the study of the theology through the notion that theology has about who are we as human beings, the anthropology, the study of that anthropos, which is the human being, we can translate. So what is a human being, for example? Is it a composite of spirit and body? Okay, that's a dualistic anthropology because you are thinking in terms of spirit, body, and only two categories that then you have a trouble like Descartes, the philosopher had, how do they come into communication with each other if they are really two different natures of two different uh, modes of understanding what the spirit in us is, what the body in us is. That's a dualistic anthropology, but it's not the anthropology that we might call biblical anthropology or theological. It's not dualistic, although many times has been presented as such, but at least it introduces a third element and speaks about the body and the soul and the spirit. And then the soul as an element that brings together the body and the spirit is what theological anthropology, I think, has to contribute to the understanding of what a human being is. But in that sense, it's not the topic today, so we can discuss if you want in the, in the discussion later. But basically, theological anthropology is what theology has to say about what are we as human beings. And hence, part of the theological anthropology is what the church, the Catholic church, and many, uh, if not all the Christian churches have been saying, and are most of them still saying today, that as human beings, biblically and theologically understood, we are either male or female, and that uh, all other variants are pathological, as I have shown you the medical labels, make that a pathology, and it's not that they don't accept it exists, but they are not accepted as legitimate, let's say, or to be welcomed variants of human sexuality and uh, human oh, okay, sexual experience. So it's not that the church denies that 
the variety of uh, sexual identities exist, but it does not want to acknowledge them as variants that God has wished for us. So when a person has one of these variants, it has to think I have a problem. It does not think according to this theological anthropology that is not for all and only for the majority. The person that does not fit the binary category has to think I have a problem and then it's either a medical problem and then I have to search for a medical solution or a psychological problem if it has to do with my desire or some other kind of problem. But I cannot celebrate my sexual identity if it is non-binary within the context of a church that does not accept that because, well, many people do because thanks be to God, what officially the church preaches is not all. So that we have the official pre preaching and then we have priests like the one that in 1969, and he was the first one, founded a group for homosexual Christians in California, which is up to today, the biggest, it's the oldest, but also the strongest um, group of homosexual or today is LGTB. It's called Dignity in the US. It was founded by a priest that later left the priesthood and married and uh, li lived as a psychologist and an artist that he was in California. But um, this reality of homosexuality was only last or the previous century, in the 19th century, you might all know a writer called Oscar Wilde, that his most famous, I guess, novel is the portrait of Dorian Gray. So Oscar Wilde, when he was born, it was just then that the death penalty was removed in England because of homosexuality. And I take, pick up England because of the Oscar Wilde and because he went later in prison, he was in prison because of the homosexuality. So this is not so long ago, 19th century, death penalty. But in Oscar Wilde's life and in when I was born, still in Spain, you could go to jail because of being homosexual. And today in the world, there are some countries where you can face death penalty because of being homosexual and other countries where you can go to jail because of being homosexual. And that was the case in 1969 in the US, believe it or not, because that seems probably unbelievable to, to those of you who are younger, but in 1969, so this is less than 50 years ago, in the US, there were bars or pubs, places where homosexual people would gather, mostly men, and police would break in and just consider what they were doing together because of the homosexuality as a crime and could take people to prison and could fine people and could cause havoc among them. It was then, 1969, that this first um, group of Catholic, because Dignity is Catholic, Catholic uh, homosexuals was founded in 1969. But as it has happened in other challenges of society, Catholics, Christians in general, not only Catholics, are pioneers in starting some uh, kind of advoc advocacy and activism in that sense. But then soon the movement turns to be separated from the church, as of course nowadays homosexual groups are mostly not uh, Christian or not in the church. And the Christian and especially the Catholic groups that exist of homosexual and LGTB people now, nowadays have trouble in being accepted from the others because of being Catholic. And that's, of course, there is a reason, which is the institutional church being close to certain uh, understandings. And recently, and that's why I picked the topic recently, we have heard that with Pope Francis, there was hope for many people who are homosexual and thought they might have the pleasure and the joy and the deep uh, relief and spiritual joy of being blessed in the church as homosexual couple. And now they have seen this document that you might be aware, recent document of the Vatican saying that marriage is only for a male and a female and that uh, in the church, the couples that are homosexual cannot be blessed, which interrupts or maybe not, because as I said, one thing is the officiality, another is what really happens in the different parishes. And I know of Benedictine and Franciscan and Jesuit priests that have been blessing couples that are of the same sex and telling them not that you have a problem, you have a pathology, you need to cure yourself or to repent even, but 
celebrating their capacity to love and then challenging them to love in a full Christian way, which is not that easy, right? Because you want to love in fidelity and you want to love in a way that's at all times respectful of the unique and original identity of the other person. And you want to love in a way that's both serving the other and, and upholding the other and being ready to, to be there for the other and yet also being respectful of your own limits and your own needs. And so this is a big challenge. Love is a big challenge. And that's what these couples with these priests that have been doing it can concentrate on, not I have spoken of in the UK. It was shocking to the society. Theresa May was then the, the uh, prime minister in England. And she was shocked by the fact and actually appeared and said a few words about it, that 5%, that's a survey of 19, uh, 2018, 5% of youngsters in the UK nowadays are, I was going to say the soft word, invited, but some of them directly forced by the parents forced or invited into something called conversion therapy. And conversion therapy is what the name indicates, right? I'm inviting you to join a group isolated in the countryside or to come regularly to some prayers and some gatherings where we'll try to help you out of your sexual identity, which is wrong because it's below the table that I showed you and not the binary one. Who did those conversion therapies? Where? were they done? Well, mostly were Muslim or Catholic institutions that were behind the programs of conversion therapy. And as I said, up to 5% of youngsters were, were experiencing those. And in some cases might be only talking to some priest or some person that tries to um, convince you of certain things and ideas. But in other cases, it was as much as being 15 days, two weeks, isolated from your friends and your family and living within, as I said, a farm in the country where you would be drilled daily with this type of messages against uh, who you believed you were. So this is uh, also some reflections about this, but uh, I would like to also say a couple of things theologically. If I still have some minutes, Anson, where are we with the time? Five, some five more minutes. Here. Okay. So theologically, I would like to say something because theologically, we have two things in theology that are, I mean, the faith of the church, right? We speak about faith and church. About the faith, there are two main axes, two main, like, uh, supports of the whole understanding of what our faith is and at this at least theoretical level and we call them the trinity and christology this is what our friends the orthodox and we had an orthodox uh, a colleague here but at least in the ukraine i'm i'm talked by a friend of mine who is from the ukraine that when they bless or when they cross themselves right i usually do like this but she told me that her family taught her to do it like this and then to do like that, the crossing. And why like this? Because these three fingers represent the Trinity, that God is one in three persons. And these two fingers represent Jesus that is may, uh, divine and human at the same time. So that we have the Trinity here and the Christology here. And that's the whole summary of the Christian theology and the Christian faith in one hand. And we use this hand to cross ourselves, said my friend, the Ukrainian. So these two things, there is a problem. If we understand this masculinity and femininity, the binary gender categories as essential for us as human beings. So theological anthropology is telling us this is something essential to your identity, the binary. Then we have a Trinitarian problem and a Christological problem, which is basically you are left, you, you have bombarded the whole basis of our credo and our uh, theology. And why is that so? In three minutes. So the Trinitarian, you might be familiar, probably not, but yes, when we say the creed, right, if you go to church and we say of the same substance, right, co-substantial, I don't know how it's said in English, but 
we, we say that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the three, share one substance because they are one God. They are three persons, but one God. One substance. The essence of these three persons is one, not two. So if we have that the masculinity of Jesus, the incarnated Son of God, is essential to what Jesus was, then either we say also the Father is masculine and also the Holy Spirit is masculine, and then we would have masculine trinity that has never been set by the tradition because the father has always been set. It's beyond this category of sex. So if we have that, okay, thanks. If we have that, then we have a trinitarian problem because suddenly the father and the son would not be homoousios. But this is not a problem with the incarnation. It's only a problem if we consider the masculinity of Jesus essential to what Jesus was. So that is a Trinitarian problem. But then we have also a Christological problem, which Christology is about redemption, right? Jesus saving us, Jesus allowing us to have all that we are to be redeemed. There is an axiom in theology that comes from the early uh, years of the church. Gregor von Nazianzus in the fourth century had said, what has not been assumed in the humanity of Jesus, what has not been assumed has not been redeemed. What was not in Jesus was not redeemed. But we say in the credo also, we are in all equal to Jesus except sin, right? Well, women, we have to say, in all equal to Jesus except sin and sex. Because if that were essential, the masculinity of Jesus were essential, then we would need to make the distinction of sin and also sex. If the masculinity, on the other hand, is not essential, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It doesn't mean it's a construct in a way that sometimes it's spoken of as something that has no reality other than in the subjectivity. I don't believe that. I believe masculinity exists in the mind, in the heart, but also in the facts, and femininity exists. But I don't think neither or the other are absolute or essential for who we are. I believe on the contrary that we are called by Jesus. And here I quote the third chapter of the Gospel of John, where if you remember, there is a scene when a man who is a learned man of the time, a sage, a wise man, and a scribe and a doctor of the law called Nicodemus. Nicodemus goes to visit Jesus, but because of Jesus having not very good prestige, right? He had not a very good reputation. Nowadays, we think Jesus is God. And, but in his time, you all know from the Gospels, he was thought of as a marginal figure, and for many, an immoral figure, because it was not abiding by the law, as he should have. And because on his group, it seems women were also taking part of, and that made him a very suspicious uh, character. So Nicodemus was a very respected doctor of the law, so the Gospel of John tells us Nicodemus visits Jesus at night. Well, at that time, people were not visiting each other at night because they didn't have electrical light and that was not a normal thing to do, to talk in the night. But Nicodemus visits Jesus in the night and we assume it's because he does not want to be seen by others that he is approaching that marginal rabbi called Jesus. So he comes in the night and they engage in a deep conversation about theological anthropology, among other things. And at a given moment, Jesus says something that you all will be familiar with. Nicodemus, you have to be born again, to be born again. And Nicodemus doesn't get the point and asks to be born again. How can a grown up man go back into the uterus of the mother in order to be born again? And Jesus is quick to reply, no, not from the mother, not from a woman are you to be born, but from the water and the spirit. We have understood that as the baptism later, but the fact is from the water and the spirit, then it's breaking through this gendered uh, basis for our identity. And on top of that, Jesus says, the one born from the water and the spirit, the one born again is like the wind. That I love this image, right? Because Jesus says the wind, you see the effects of it. If there is wind, you see the leaves moving and you might feel it in your face, but you don't see the wind. So the wind, nobody knows whence, from whence it comes and where it goes. 
it's free in that way. And the wind is the metaphor for the one be being born again. So that my idea of the theological anthropology is we start with a majority of dichotomic uh, characteristics with a minority of people that are very white and uh, complex as somebody has said, but rich, I would also say, and beautiful. Either the dichotomic or the diversity doesn't really matter from this theological anthropology perspective, at least the theological anthropology that I suggest you to, to consider, which is because we all, be it dichotomic or not, are called to something else. It's not that the dichotomic have to go and become queer in that way, or that the queer or non-binary have to become binary somehow, it's something else. We all, each of us, are called to our Christian. Christianization, which means actually Christification, better said, which is to let Christ live in each of us. That's again from the Apostle Paul. It is not me, but Christ who lives in me. What that means is I am called to be original in the world. I am called to not think of myself as belonging to a category, the category female, male, in between, the category queer, the category German, Austrian, Catalan, the category non, lay, non, non, Christian, non, Christian, all labels have a role. Some of them should be eliminated, but many of them are needed in a time of time and space or in, in our life of time and space. But none of them can be substituting our process of spiritual growth. None of them can be tutoring, right, containing or shaping our process of spiritual growth. They are, maybe, if we are living them well, according to my understanding, they can only be springboards that we leave behind in order to jump to the arms of the embracing and welcoming God. Thank you. Thank you, dear Teresa, for the wonderful lecture. Um, would you take it forward, Georg? Yes, um, I would like to invite um, Jakob to respond um, with your own experiences. Um, what do you think, what do you agree with, what do you don't agree with, just um, for some minutes, um, your response. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much, Teresa, for your um, speech. Um, gonna be hard to respond in very few minutes to this, but I, I will still give it a try. Um, I would like to start with some personal experiences because this was somehow the wish and then also to give some thoughts on what you have been mentioning. So first, some personal experiences. Uh, one is uh, linked to the fact that I always tried to somehow build bridges in between theology, faith and uh, politically engaged community, mostly left people. And uh, I always had to defend myself for being religious, having studied theology, because of many reasons. But one main fact has always been the gender issue. It has always been one of the first things that has been addressed to me. Okay, the church is uh, highly patriarchal, highly homophobe, uh, highly excluding people, as uh, Therese has been mentioning with her statistics of first uh, input of the speech. And I do agree on that. It's a matter of fact. And uh, my second experience with this is uh, studying theology in the uh, University of Vienna. I yeah, know that some of you are doing this. And uh, yeah. I enjoyed my studies. I learned quite a lot there. I also had a lot of doubts, but again, there, and this, we're speaking about a um, public faculty in the, in the end of the 21st century. Um, there is in the curriculum, at least at my times, and I think now it's still the same. There is a one, uh, you have to take one course obligatory with some uh, gender link. So uh, I don't know how it is nowadays, but in my times, and this is like not so much time ago, maybe five, six, seven years, um, 
there was the option of taking a course on uh, the Old Testament regarding the book of Miriam. This was then considered as being already a gender topping uh, because the name was Miriam. Uh, by the way, given by a professor who is now also uh, in line with not blessing homosexual people or to do something about Mary, that's also gendered. So this was all the gender-based education you could receive as a theologian, uh, unless you're not really willing into entering different studies or careers. So um, this is somehow reflecting that both theology and also the church um, are neglecting this topic and thus leaving people behind. And they're not leaving beh people behind just a few of them, they're leaving behind a lot of people. And uh, also, as Teresa said, it uh, doesn't really matter how many people they leave behind. If one person is left behind, that's uh, too much. So for me, it's very clear that we have to break with this, um, which is not easy. <laughs> so my question would be how to break with this. Uh, Teresa was also mentioning this document of the, of the Vatican that has been published recently. And at least in, well, in the Austrian context, which I'm more familiar with, some churches and parishes are uh, doing something you could call civil disobedience or religious disobedience, or maybe it's religious obedience, but disobedience against authorities, namely to put uh, rainbow flags out from the church uh, towers. Uh, this might be a small step, and I think um, this won't solve the problem, but I think this is something we should really take into consideration. Um, yeah, I think one of, of the, the main problems Teresa has been showing is that whole drive of the church is about um, sticking to labels and definitions. In that case, a very um, uh, a dichotomy, like a binary system, this binary labeling, and this reflects a main aspect of maybe humans and especially the Catholic Church, which is um, to rule. And I think the main challenge is not to rule, also not to rule definitions. I think um, postmodernity shows us how to overcome this 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 identity establishing thing. But I also think that within the, the, the Christian faith itself, there's something really deeply connected to not to rule and to step back from these categories. Um, I would like to, to show one picture. I was, and this is like my last point and also connected to my experience. Um, finally, I found then something where these um, thoughts on theology and gender are connected. Um, Teresa, maybe you know her, uh, Marcela Althaus Reit. This is an Argentinian theologian. Yes. Um, when I read her, it was a deep revelation from her for me. And fortunately, it's not translated into German. I really would like to do that. So if anybody knows uh, how we can organize that, I would really like to do it. And she wrote a book. Um, about uh, theological perversions on sex, politics, and gender. And she's reflecting on many things in there. Uh, one thing you slightly uh, touched, namely the Christology. So she's asking some very tough questions. She reflects, for example, about the non-existing sexuality of Jesus that has, is constructed in the mainstream biblical texts and also in the mainstream reflections on that. And she goes further. She reflects about what do we know about the penis of Jesus? She's saying, okay, we know that he, uh, being a Jew, he, he is going to be uh, beschnitten. I don't know what's the... Circumcised. Yeah, the, the, Circumcised. The, the English expression. Yeah, exactly. So we know this. And we also know that he has been dressed as a somehow um, heterosexual person, but even this we cannot take for granted. So she tries to look behind it. And uh, she is not so much debating about um, what sex or gender Jesus then had, but she is mainly asking the question, okay, 
does this fit to our identities? If we want to identify with Christ, is this, is this possible? So I highly recommend this for reading. And I would just like to show you one picture. Um, I hope this works. Yeah. Um, you all should see um, a picture now. Do you see that one? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, okay, yes. perfect. So the picture is taken from the diocese in Graz, in Styria, in, uh, in Austria. It shows the Heilige Kümmernis, Wilge Fortis. Uh, for me, this is quite impressive. Um, I won't tell you now the, the story behind it. You can read it up in the internet, but uh, I might like just leave the picture for the discussion and maybe gather some impressions you, you might have and then discuss on what does this picture uh, make in yourself if you, if you see that picture. Um, yes. I think um, this was it in, in, the, in a nutshell. So just to sum it up, I, I'm struggling with the, the experiences I'm having myself, both within the church, but also within other groups that are yeah, feeling offended by the approach of the church regarding its, its gender questions. But I also um, believe that um, within the church, and within the, the, the tradition and the theology, there is something you could call a queer approach or a more inclusive approach, however you wanna call it. It's not so much about those, those, those terms, but I also think that it's very important to find a, not only a political language on, that, on, on those questions, but also a, a theological one, a faith-based one. And there is, the, 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 the only problem is that it's not uh, the main one and that it is not taught, for example, at, at universities and not even open-minded liberal universities as the University of Vienna is. This is also why I appreciate this, this talk. Um, I think we cannot do more than giving a short impulse on that. Uh, yeah, so my my... My question to you would be once to reflect on this uh, on this image, and maybe it would be also nice to um, share more about those um, about the main question. Maybe coming back to what you were have, have been mentioning regarding the theological anthropology, because one of the main cores of Christian faith is that God becomes human. So uh, my impression is that God becomes man. Why? Because also the image we have of God is a male one. You've been saying before that the uh, also the, the, the Bible and also theological belief knows that God goes beyond gender. So I think this is crucial for having a, a broader understanding what kind of human God is turning into when he or she becomes human. Thank you, Jakob. Um, just Anton, then, yeah, that I say something or not uh, right yes, now? Yes, of course, you can comment, yes. Okay, so I, I just want to say a joke first, that is just <laughs> like, <laughs> which is this joke that Cardinal Ratzinger, poor gentleman that the Pope uh, dies and goes to heaven, and then it says, okay, so is... Um, uh, can I see God or where is God? And then one angel comes and says, uh, okay, but before you go in, I just, so that you are not shocked when you go in, right? She is black, it says to the Pratzinger, right? So how it's using the label of feminine and the label of being black as, as shocking us, which we know as Jacob has said, and I also have said, of course, none of us thinks God is white or black or red. And of course it's not male or female, but she is black. <gasps> Suddenly it's a shock, right? So that is the little joke. But what I wanted to say also quickly uh, is that I, I love when you said, Jacob, that in the tradition, it's not like this, uh, that this distinction between what now the official documents say and the richness of experiences within the church. And that's why I have wanted to say not that the first Catholic group of homosexual people activists were founded 1969 in California. It's the first group ever 
there was not a non-Catholic group. So it's pioneering those movements of liberation also in the gender realm. But now you tell that to LGTB people and they will just laugh at you, of course, but it's important not to forget. And what I wanted to add to this is this surprise that I had not so long ago, a few years ago, when by reading the book of her life of Teresa of Avila, that uh, Spanish saint of the 16th century, maybe all of you, maybe not, but if you are Catholic, maybe, know this image of the saint being per pierced by an angel that holds an spear Light. or a, 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 a narrow, an arrow with a burning flame at the at the, at the top, right? And just being pierced, that's like being penetrated by God, right? And this is how Bernini, the great sculptor, understood and represented that in his famous sculpture that tourists go to see and that I went to see when I was in Rome. And it's this woman, Teresa of Avila, just being completely overwhelmed by the fire of God penetrating her. So this is an image that, of course, reminds us of the heterosexual uh, relationship. And even my name is Teresa and she's my patron saint. And I thought that was the highest mystical experience of Teresa of Avila. Well, I had even read her book without noticing, but I recently gave a course and I had to study her again. And then what is my surprise is that by the end of her book of the life, Teresa of Avila explicitly says what her highest mystical experience was. And it had nothing to do with the person. It's not that the person doesn't appear in her biography, it does. So she did have that experience and she explains it like that. Good, but she doesn't make a big deal out of it. But she does make a big deal out of another mystical experience that it comes towards the end of her book, that's chapter 39. And in chapter 39, what does Teresa of Avila see? She sees Jesus where? Within the breasts of the father. And it's like, wait a minute. Now we have a father with breasts. She sees that. And she says explicitly three times, this is after that vision, I was transformed. And after that vision, which is, you can call it a queer vision, right? You have a father and you have breasts. And Jesus is between the breasts as understanding the strongest way that she could picture of being welcomed and embraced, which is the topic that gathers us here today, right? What it means is being embraced by Teresa in her vision is going beyond all imaginaries of sexual binary because she has the name of father applied to breasts. And this is, by the way, how also the beginning of the Song of Songs starts with the breasts for the lover, with, which supposedly is a he. But also having Jesus, as I said, in the middle of them. And not only that, but it's not an isolated experience. All the mystics that have spoken to us about their own dealings with God have gone for Jesus and for God beyond any gender categories. Before we had a gender ideology or so-called gender ideology and before our era. For example, Julianne of Norwich, she is from the 14th century. She speaks of Jesus, our mother. Why doesn't she say our father? Well, the father is another one, right? So Jesus is, yes, the son of the father and our mother. And then she says how Jesus nourishes us with a uh, milk, his own milk, and how teaches us to walk and teaches us to speak, and it's a mother for us. So that's an image she uses with no problem. And last point, in the Gospel of John, it appears a word that I know from medicine, which is the Greek word kolpos, which I was surprised when I read the Gospel the first time in Greek, because I thought, what do you mean the kolpos of the father? That's in the prologue of the Gospel of John. It appears that the son is always with the father. But if you read the, the true text and the original text, usually in English, it's translated at the bosom of the father. But the word kolpos literally means uterus or vagina, more vagina than uterus. So what is this word doing? Of course, it's used um, figuratively, but it's a feminine based metaphor to speak about the father welcoming Jesus. And then in chapter 13 of the Gospel of John is Jesus welcoming John, the beloved disciple. When at the Last Supper, the beloved disciple is leaning towards Jesus. It's not at the breast, as Luther translated in German and many other translations. It's not the breast. It's the corpus of Jesus. So it means that these images that might help us go beyond this strict binary 
they are not only images that we can and we should and we are invited to create nowadays, but also it, it, there is a link in the tradition that I agree should be studied in the theology school. Thank you so much. Um, we would open the floor for discussion for five minutes more before we close with a prayer. But with a quick comment to Jacob, uh, to Jakob, is that the University of Vienna did have a seminar on LGBT two years ago, which was chaired by Professor Gerhard Marschutz. And I was also part of the seminar. There were, I think, 10 to 15 of us theologians. And it was an incredible seminar where he also invited um, uh, people concerned from the LGBT community. So there were uh, people with whom we could have dialogue and understand. Um, sadly, it didn't go further, but we did have something two years ago. Um, and now we open the floor for discussion. So anyone who would like to ask something, we have five minutes before we uh, close because we have um, gone a little bit little ahead of time. <laughs> Hello? Yes. Mm, who's this? Sandeep. Yes, Sandeep. Sandeep. Hello? Yes, Sandeep. Uh, sister, th thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. I, uh, I simply loved it. Now, my question is, you have posed two problems, the Trinitarian problem and the Christological problem. So uh, my question is, within a Christological problem, when we try to maintain the hypothesis that Jesus fully human and fully divine. So I think that within this category of Jesus being fully divine, the hundred percent, why don't we include all the sexes into that? That could be a fully human, that nothing is, you know, outside, all are included. What sister has to say? Because Sandeep, what um, Gregor of Nazianzus and the whole patristic mm -hmm. theology is, is yeah. emphasizing is what has not been assumed in the humanity of Jesus has mm. not been redeemed. Because of course, in the div divinity, everything is there. Of course, mm. the divinity is everything, right? So why mm. redemption then? Why we need redemption if God is already embracing us all to begin with the mystery mm -hmm. of incarnation is what Gregor from Nazianzus is pondering about when it says everything that's important, essential for a human life is in Jesus, in the humanity of Jesus, because otherwise you don't need the incarnation. So that's why the point of the sexuality mm -hmm. is important to that. To, it's relevant to Christology only if we try to make the point that Masculinity and femininity, hence dichotomic distinction is essential. If you speak of sexuality in a way that leaves open these different options, then it's already there because Jesus had a sexuality. That's what's important. Jesus had, if Jesus had not had a sexuality, then we would have a problem. We would have a dimension of our humanity that was not in Jesus. But I don't have that problem because even if my sexuality is feminine, whatever that means, Jesus had the sexuality. I have enough with that, right? It's yes. enough for me to have my sexuality redeemed, but only, Sandeep, mm -hmm. only if mm -hmm. the distinction of masculine and feminine is not deemed essential. If you try to push that the mm -hmm. distinction is essential or any other category is essential in themselves, then mm -hmm. we have a Christological problem. That's okay. why I speak of the distinction because it's real, I see it, and, and I think it's relevant to talk about it, but I mm -hmm. do not accept that as a essential and hence i do not accept that as normative that people that fall outside of it need to be converted that's my point right yeah thank you thank you very much you're welcome sandeep thank you sandeep mandy has a question yeah um are we not in the church where there is um uh, the church is insisting on, on, on binary identification of sexuality, where we actually have biological evidence that there is ambiguity, um, as well as people's own inner experience. Is that not the church saying that God has made a mistake? That's beautiful. That's a problem for the church. And I think for this type of church or these documents, at least that I like to always say we are the church, right? So that uh, 
But for this official magisterium, indeed, it's a problem. So I don't have anything else to say. It is a problem for the people who are excluded, of course, but it is a problem for the church because then it's like um, either God did, did wrong or you have to say, well, the accumulated the structural sin has caused certain disturbances that might have led to this pathology. And then you are just uh, escaping for the tangent or something. Can I have one more question before we close? And yes, Teresa. If there is not a question, because my one little final point that is, sometimes I have said, and maybe you find some interview or something that they have said how I believe this sexual diversity is a blessing. And when I say that, it's not that I believe people who are or belong to a sexual minority are more holy than others or especially gifted humanly or something. No, people who are in a sexual minority are as miserable and as wonderful as anybody else, of course. But the fact that sexual minorities exist, it is a blessing for all of us. It is maybe a burden and a, 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 something very painful for those who are in a minority when the minority is discriminated, but a blessing for the, the, the humanity in itself, because I believe that we are called to understand what it is that is holy in our love, in our capacity for loving, and what is sacramental in a sacrament. When you have a sacrament like marriage, there is something there that it is holy, otherwise you wouldn't call it the sacrament. What it is the holiness of the sacrament of, um, it must be something that God has, right? Like in, in uh, how do we call it? Um, forgiveness, right? The sacrament of uh, forgiveness. You have there the mercy of God, which is being present and expressed in the sacrament. In the Eucharist, you have this redemption and the love of God for us in the communion. What is expressed in the sacrament of marriage when we consider that the sacrament? Is it the complementarity between masculine and feminine? I think that complementarity might exist and might be beautifully experienced, but in God there is no complementarity of male and female, so that cannot be the holy, that cannot be the substance of the sacrament. Is it the reproduction, having children? I think it's beautiful to have children. I'm a nun, but I wanted to have nine children myself, so it's one of the things I'm missing, and now I'm not, uh, I'm not able anymore, so I won't have nine children, or not even one. But I love the idea of having children and what it implies. But God doesn't have children in this way, it does not reproduce. So that is not the holiness, although it's a bonum, like Augustinus from Ippo had already said in the fifth century. They are good things, but they are not the substance. So what had Augustinus already said is the substance of the sacrament. And what I agree with, he said the inseparability. And this is something tough nowadays. My parents are divorced, so I know what I'm talking about. But I love that. I love it. When I say to you, I'm for you, I love you. It's not, I love you, and then tomorrow I don't love you anymore. It's not like, oh, in 10 years, we'll see whether I love you still. And I, I as I said, uh, my parents are divorced, and I think the church should also have an understanding. And But the sacrament, it's for me very clear that it is in that unconditional love that one person can express to another, which can only be based on faith and faith in God, because how do you know how you are going to feel in 10 years? You don't know, but you are trusting and you are trusting in a way that's radical. I love that. And if that you would agree, it is in God because God loves us in that such faithful and conditional way. If that's the substance of the sacrament, then why is that not possible between people of the same sex? That would be my, my point. Thank you, Teresa. There wasn't a hand. There is a last question from Francisca. If we have time, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would just be interested in an answer to, uh, to an argument. And it is um, that the church uh, should not allow, let's say, homosexual marriage, for example, because if we do this, then what's the next step? Like, would it be then marriage between more people and so on and so on? So mm -hmm. I would just be interested in your answer to that. Okay. So this notion of polyamor, yeah, polyamorous, amorous, or polyamor is how I know this idea of more people. Well, this, first of all, my short answer is 
never advisable, not for the church, not for us as human beings, individual human beings, to make decisions out of fear. So if what you are fearing something, don't make a decision because of that. That's a bad way to go, right? And so clearly I do not think it's justifiable as a church to make or not make a decision because of fear. You have to have another reason because otherwise we are doomed as, as church and people. You have to have substantial positive reasons to make, uh, not only out of fear. And then about the, the polyamor, then that, that would be a whole different thing. And always respecting the experience and how we different people learn and, and navigate. My personal experience or whom I know and what I think about this topic is that it's hard enough to love one, let alone two in that way that the, the couple demands. Of course, I'm in a community. We are not one, we are not two, we are 30 nuns, right? So, but it's not the same type. It's not the same type. It's not this mm, being available for that particular person in a different way than you are for other people. And it's not this being one that uh, so strongly the liturgy of the church and the biblical text emphasize this becoming one flesh. What is this becoming one flesh? This would be a whole other right lecture on its own, but that, that's a very important expression for me. And this becoming one flesh, it's never fully achieved with one person. So I cannot even imagine with two or more people. So I don't think one thing leads to the other. And um, I think the church should not make decisions out of fear. So go for the blessing and for the marriage of the homosexual couples or couples of whatever, of whatever uh, sexual identity and don't fear that that will, um, that will necessarily move into other options that might not be compatible with uh, a full engagement with another human being. Thank you so much, Teresa. And thank you so much once again to you and to Jakob. Uh, and thank you to all the participants. We would like to close uh, today's meeting with a, with a small prayer, which Jakob would lead us into, a moment of silence where we all can connect and interiorize what we have learned or unlearned in the session today. Jakob. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I did not uh, know precisely what Teresa is going to talk about. So um, the prayer is not precisely on the, the gender topic, which could have been nice, but I choose a, a prayer by a theologian um, mainly, well, maybe, you, yeah, I guess may, uh, some of you know of, it's uh, Dorothee Söller, German theologian and also feminist theologian, um, who tried to express her faith in a credo, in a creed. And I, I do think that uh, also the topics we have been discussing today are reflected in that. Here we go. I believe in God who did not finish creating the world, like a thing that must always remain so, who does not rule by eternal laws, which are immutable, not according to natural orders of rich and poor, the knowledgeable and the uniformed rulers and the delivered. I believe in God who wants the contradiction of the living, the change of all conditions through our work through our politics. I believe in Jesus Christ, who was right when he, as a single man who cannot do anything, just like us, worked to change all conditions and perished in the process. Measuring him, I recognize how our intelligence is crippled, our imagination stifled, our efforts wasted because we do not live as he lived. Every day I am afraid that he died in vain because he is buried under our churches, because we have betrayed his revolution in obedience and fear of the authorities. I believe in Jesus Christ who rises into our lives that we may be set free from prejudice and presumption, from fear and hatred and continue his revolution towards kingdom. I believe in the spirit who came into the world with Jesus in the commun communion of all peoples, 
and our responsibility for what will become of our earth, a valley of misery, hunger, and violence, or the city of God. I believe in just peace that can be achieved and the possibility of a meaningful life for all people in the future of this world of God. Amen. Thank you very much, Jakob. Thank mm -hmm. you, Teresa. Thank you for all of you who have participated. Um, it was beautiful to listen to your thoughts and to shared experiences. And yeah, we wish you all the best and have a the good Saturday. Session. And the next session, yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm just it's still taken it's... by the prayer. <laughs> Beautiful prayer. Yes. Thank yes. you, Jacob. Thank you so much.